Thanks very much, everyone, for coming here today. So my name is Sean Lacey. I'm the Research Integrity and Compliance Officer for Munster Technological University. And I'm given, I have the honor of chairing this morning's, uh, this morning's um, launch of CORI, which is a collaborative, collaborative open resources on research integrity and ethics. And the hybrid event that we have here today, we've titled the Research Integrity, Ethics and CORI, more than a soap. So I think everyone hopefully will get kept with a small bit of humor that we have in this. Now, the purpose of this event, we have two really main points to this. We have the keynote from Dr. Suzanne McMurphy, who I'll, I'll introduce in a couple of minutes. And then we had, I suppose, the demonstration of the actual, the actual CORI resources, which will be led by uh, Dr. Tom Farley, uh, with uh, input from Dr. Anya Garoshda and Dr. Tara Doherty. So maybe just to just give a small bit of a background, I won't take too much of your time. So just a small bit of a background on, there we go, on us, the team. So and where, how did this all come about? So what mostly would, I think would recognize us at, uh, at this point, uh, so Tom, I've already mentioned. So Tom is a senior lecturer uh, and, and academic developer with the Intruder Project. Um, I would describe Tom as kind of being the brains behind this operation, especially when it comes to the resources that we're going to be showcasing later on. Uh, so and very much a tough taskmaster. We'll, we'll, come, we'll come to that as well. We'll talk about that with later on as well. I've already introduced myself. Dr. Arne Durosta is a senior lecturer in the Department of Applied Social Studies and is also the chair, co-chairperson with Tom of the Human Research Ethics Committee that we have here in NTU. Dr. Suzanne McMurphy is an associate professor in the Department of Sociology and Criminology at the University of Winds Windsor in, in Ontario, Canada. Uh, she's also the director of the Office of Research Ethics and is the chair of the Research Ethics Board uh, in uh, uh, Windsor as well. And then we have Dr. Tara Doherty, who's a senior research support officer in uh, Atlantic Technological University. Unfortunately, Tara is an apology for today. There's uh, been a, there was a brief bereavement that she couldn't actually make it down today, but uh, we have a short video from her and she sends her best wishes uh, for this launch. And I suppose maybe just to see, look, how do we come, come together in this five? I think the first three, the top here, would make sense. Obviously, we all work in MCU. Where, where's the connect with Windsor? Well, back in August, September last year, Tom was a research fellow over at the University of Windsor. When he was over there, he would have met uh, Suzanne. They really kicked it off on all things research ethics. When Tom came back, and thankfully he did come back to us in MTU, when he came back, he said, we should really look for an opportunity to collaborate with Suzanne. And Intruder a funding call came available with the DLR funding. I'll talk about that now in a second, minute or two. Came up and we saw it as a great opportunity to link in with Suzanne. And it's been brilliant the last couple, six, seven months yeah. uh, working with Suzanne on this and really brought real richness to the resources that we're going to showcase later on. Dr. Tara Darty um, is actually a co-chairperson of the Research Ethics Committee in ATU Donegal as well. And she will be a champion of research integrity and somebody I collaborate a lot with an across institutional research integrity training initiative that we have in the university. So Tara would consider a lot of training with me uh, on research integrity. And that's what kind of brought the five of us here together. When it, I've mentioned a couple of times there about Intutor and DLR. So DLR being the funding that we got digital learning resources. So what's that all about? So mostly you probably are aware at this point, but Intutor is aims to transform learning, teaching and assessment by focusing on the student experiencing experience and developing staff capabilities. The DLR funding that we, we were able to utilize was one opportunity to actually follow through in this aim from, uh, from Intutor. When it comes to the DLRs, they aid students and staff in the learning process and can incorporate anything digital from e-learning modules to video-based content. And when it comes to the actual funding call, in total, across the five campuses in MTU, there were four, 14 projects that were successful, which enabled staff to create tools to complement and support the strength in their teaching, continue their CPD, while also creating tools to ensure the student learning experience is enriched. And so that's the Intutor uh, uh, funding call, the DLR funding call, that we were successful in actually getting uh, support for, which enables this Cori project. Now, what about Cori? So what do we do with Cori? Uh, this is only just to give an overview. Tom is really going to take us through what we're doing in Cori, but we use the Articulate Rise 360 platform to de uh, develop media-rich content to, on areas of research integrity and research ethics. The content would involve interactive documents. Again, Tom will showcase this. Audio files, video files, with interactive uh, examples and exercises based on practical scenarios and dilemmas that researchers can encounter in research integrity and research ethics. And throughout the whole process of developing these resources, what we try to do is align the resources with the universal design learning, so UDL, and also have them all openly available for, for any researcher, not just an MTU, ATU, or Windsor to use, 
with the wider research community as well. When it comes, this is the last slide for me, and then it's over to the main, because you're really here now to listen to Suzanne and Tom, just want to kind of give up an overview of how do we actually get to this point, because this is this is a milestone for us in the Cori team, or something we're very happy that she reached this point, but as you can imagine with any project, there's a lot of work that happens behind the scenes. We had four main arms or four main phases when it comes to the Cori project, the first being the actual planning. So we were, would have been told we got the plan, uh, funding in November. We would have planned then what we wanted to do, what, what content were we really looking at uh, for the initial three or four weeks, maybe actually a bit longer if I look at the timeline there, because we formally launched the project in an event, uh, in an online event in February, and where we showcased look, what we plan on developing and pause to see, get, I suppose, for an opportunity for people to provide feedback. Were we on the right track? Before we went off and developed the resources, we had these great ideas, where did they seem to be okay? And we got very positive feedback from that launch uh, in February. Then we went off and developed the resources. Now, as you can imagine, that took time. Like we had an idea of the content, we knew our topics, we knew what from our years of experience in research ethics, we had the content, but how do you kind of package it together to actually make it interactive, make it exciting? I suppose satisfy Tom's high, very high demands when it comes to the interactivity. And hands up, Tom made me do my recording a second time. He wasn't happy with my first recording. So very, very tough, but it was really Tom's leadership and vision that helped us kind of have these resources that we're going to showcase later on. So uh, very much kind of appreciation to Tom for that. Then before we come to this event here, because this is us launching the resources, but it was important before we launched that we tested it. So we reached out to uh, colleagues across the, the various universities for feedback on the resources. And this, this would be colleagues and both that would be involved in research ethical review, but also end users that are at the other side of, that are submitting a research ethics application forms that are involved in research integrity, involved in research data management, to kind of get their input on the resources to see how they will go. And based on their feedback, we then arrived at this point here. This is the launch. And we're very happy, we're very excited to be here. This is a very proud moment for us. But what we have, this is the first part of it. We will end up sharing these resources. There will be a link that you'll all get later on. They'll go up on our research ethics webpage that we have in the university. We're going to share them openly on the Center for Open Science webpage, and there's going to be other links afterwards as well. So these resources that we have will be uh, openly available afterwards as well. And then really over to our first main part to today, which is a keynote from uh, uh, Dr. Suzanne McMurphy. And before or maybe just, uh, I suppose, asking Suzanne to come up, I just want to give a small, very small bit of background information on Suzanne. So somebody would be aware of Suzanne's background, would have come across her in other events that we've had across uh, the university recently. But Suzanne has over 25 years of experience in research ethics. This experience comes across from both the US and from Canada. <clears throat> she would have joined the uh, research ethics board in the University of Windsor in 2010, became the director of the Office of Research Ethics, and the chair of the Research Ethics Board in 2016, was in that role for over six years, was went on a sabbatical for one year, and then is back in that role now at the moment. What's interesting with the sabbatical is uh, during that time, she was consultant to the World Health Organization Secretariat on Research Ethics uh, Reviews. And um, there are actually just two other points I just want to kind of say, because it's quite important, and they're just escape my mind there. But Suzanne is also a member of the Consortium of Advanced Effective Research Ethics Oversight, located at the University of Pennsylvania, and if she had any time to spare, which she seems to have, she's also a researcher. And I think that's very important for people that are at the, you will say, the review side of research ethics or research integrity, that they are actually a researcher as well. They have the sleeves up actually involved in doing the research. And what the Suzanne's research interests are in the, are in the improvement of research ethics protocols and developing metrics to assess the quality of research ethics oversight. So without any further ado, round of applause for Dr. Suzanne. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. So I'm really, really happy to be here today. Thanks, Sean, for that introduction. This has been a really, really fun project, and it's brought a lot of things together that I've been working on over the past few years. And it's been a great group to work with. And if Nick Baker is out there, a shout out to Nick Baker, because Nick was the one that connected Tom and I together when Tom was a visiting fellow at the University of Windsor. He was working with Nick in Nick's Office of Open Learning, and Nick connected us together. And so that's ultimately how we connected. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, just a little bit of time at a very, very high macro level. So I want to talk a little bit about how research ethics and research integrity are coming into their own as areas of their own discipline and scholarship. 
And then I wanna talk about how researchers ourselves are coming into this space, collaborating with research ethics and research, oh yeah, yeah, I forgot about that, thank you. And how the <laughs> integrity work that we do as research ethics and research integrity people, how that work is becoming an expertise into itself. And then finally, I wanna talk about how the Cori work is coming to contribute to that sense of trustworthiness of how what we do in research ethics uh, work, research ethics committees, as well as how we collaborate with researchers, how the Cori resources then uh, contribute to all of that um, to macro come in together. So let me just talk first about research ethics and research integrity in context. So when I went on sabbatical, as Sean was mentioning, I spent the first couple months just skimming through all of the recent ev evolutions in research ethics across the world. And what I found was there's an amazing amount of richness and complexity and dialogue happening around research ethics, particularly in these new and emerging technology areas. Like, for example, clinical research in resource limited settings was one of the things we were dealing with at the World Health Organization. So how do we roll out these vaccines? How do we roll out uh, kinds of emerging technologies in places where they could be dangerous, where there's no healthcare system to support if there are any adverse events. How do we roll out those kinds of projects in those kinds of places? So there's a lot of dialogue then around how do we do research in uh, clinically or resource limited settings. Um, there's a lot of dialogue going on around AI and emerging technologies and how should we handle that as research ethics people and research ethics committee members. Our indigenous colleagues are telling us the way in which we're applying these principles is not working for us. This is a whole colonization of the way in which you see autonomy is not working for the way we do research. And so our indigenous colleagues are challenging us to think about different ways in which we look at the principles and apply them. Um, there were other issues around AI, as I said, there's brain research going on that's pushing the boundaries of what we do as research ethics individuals in our committee work, but also how we understand that in a more macro level. And there is no place for us to come together as scholars to be able to have this kind of dialogue. So unlike bioethics, which has created a space for themselves, research ethics and research integrity doesn't have a space really in a kind of disciplinary scholarship way where we can come together, talk about these kinds of issues, challenge each other, and then particularly work with our research colleagues about the kinds of things that they're evolving. So I see research ethics and integrity scholarship sitting in this space of the epistemological paradigms and the evolution of the dialogue of, do we have the right paradigms? Do we have the right ways of thinking about policies? Do we have all of the right principles? for us to be able to apply, and that dialogue is happening in the epistemological area. Our colleagues in research are doing their own developments and their own research ethics, and the disciplinary methodologies that are evolving are pushing the boundaries of what we understand in research ethics. Qualitative research, for example, pushing photo voice, autoethnography, uh, group eth uh, autoethnography. How do we begin to think about consent? How do we think about risks? How do we think about withdrawing when you've got an auto or group ethnography? So they're pushing the boundaries of what we understand as research ethics committees. And then there are the research ethics frameworks and the integrity regulations that we apply when we do our work. So our scholarship sits in this space of all of this great understanding and dialogue, but we don't have a space to be able to bring those two things together. The work, as I call it, is the kind of work that we do in our committees when we're assessing applications, when we're making uh, judgments about protocols, about the ethical acceptability of research that's come to us to review. But we're also providing dialogue with our colleagues. We're also providing education. We're also providing different kinds of work with our students. So there's a whole area of guidance and education that we also do that's within our work where we pull from all of those three different areas we pull those together and we provide this kind of knowledge and support to our colleagues, but we don't have a space to be able to challenge ourselves with our colleagues to say, do we have the right principles? Do we have the right dialogue? Do we have the right guidance? So that ethics work takes place here, but, but we don't have the kind of background or scholarship area that we need to, to be able to work. So this is an all an argument for saying, we that do research ethics and research integrity, particularly those of us that are thinking about this in a macro level, need to begin to develop a disciplinary area or scholarship area for this kind of dialogue. And then of course, there's the pragmatic work that we do, which is when we review applications and make decisions about uh, the ethical acceptability of research, or we do integrity investigations and we make decisions about whether or not there has been an integrity breach, or do we support our researchers in engaging in ethical and uh, research integrity. 
So there's two challenges for us in trying to achieve this kind of scholarly disciplinary area. And one of those challenges is that the majority of the focus when people understand research ethics and research integrity is that we apply these research ethics frameworks, or we apply the regulations, and that we are primarily compliance, we are primar primarily risk management, we are doing sort of like oversight and monitoring of research. And in fact, that's a very small part of what we do because in all reality, we aren't in the field with our colleagues. It's our colleagues in the field that are do, that's doing the research. We aren't there with them. We have been there with them when they've come to us to say, is what we're going to do acceptable, ethically acceptable? And we're there if they come to us to say, we'd like to have a dialogue around integrity, but we aren't in the field with them. So we, are, we sit in combination with them in that kind of fluid area. The other issue is that when we look only at frameworks and research integrity as a kind of compliance monitoring, we diminish the level of expertise that we're bringing to the table. So when we sit around the table and have a dialogue around a particular protocol or a particular application, the amount of expertise that we bring and the knowledge that we bring is really rich and very rare because it is developed out of a long period of experience. So that's also been diminished when we focus just on us as a regulatory group. And so then, as I said, we need to create space for ourselves to be able to have this kind of dialogue so we can have these kind of more upper level or higher level macro discussions when we're doing our pragmatic work. The second challenge is one where Corey comes in, and that is that we don't have a mechanism for doing high level education and research ethics. So most of the training around research ethics happens in this regulatory space. Mm. So what happens is we do in Canada, the TCPS2 training that tells us about the principles, tells us about the framework, but doesn't really tell us how pragmatically those apply or how we do our work when we're in committee. CEOMS has a training, for example, Oxford University has a really nice training, um, but they introduce these principles from a regulatory framework. And so we think then that the regulatory framework is the research ethics, is the dialogue and integrity, and we miss the fact that there is much more rich, richness going on. The other thing that we do is we do localized workshops, we do one-off lectures, but ultimately what ends up happening is that most of the research ethics expertise comes from oral tradition. So you come from being part of the committee, you come from hearing what people are doing, you come from hearing the dialogue, but that doesn't actually get captured anywhere. And then that's the advantage of Corey, is if we look at what we need in order to be able to establish this kind of disciplinary area, we need to establish our trustworthiness. And establishing our trustworthiness means that we do three things, which is what trustworthiness is defined by. One is competence. So in other words, we need to be able to demonstrate that what we do has a level of ability that can be trained, that can be educated, that can be taught, but it is a level of expertise and people can rely on us to be able to apply that expertise. We need to be able to demonstrate that we've got beneficence, which means that we are acting in the best interest, we're acting with goodwill, we're acting in the public's interest, we're acting with our researchers in mind in terms of the collaboration we have with them. And then finally, we're acting with integrity. So we're acting with consistency, we're acting with transparency. And when we pull those three things together, we have then demonstrated the trustworthiness of what research ethics and research integrity bring. And that then is the bridge to us beginning to discuss, could we actually then be a discipline because here is our trustworthiness. What's wonderful about this, the other Corey resources really contribute to this dialogue. So what the Corey resources have done has pulled together a team that are both researchers as well as research ethics people and research integrity people and have that kind of expertise that I'm talking about that we bring to the table. And we brought this to the table as our team. And then we were able to provide this kind of bridge information where you take kind of a higher level understanding of the principles, apply them with a pragmatic bridge of what do we do in an ethics department? What are the kinds of things we think about? What are the kinds of questions that we ask? And what we could do then with Corey is move back and forth between those spaces of what are the principles, how do they get applied, and how do we as research ethics people see those things and give you kind of that insider view of here are all the different kinds of things that come up when we're doing reviews. When I started working for the World Health Organization, one of the things I noticed is the kind of dialogue we're having with researchers and the kind of ethical issues that are arising are exactly what we're seeing in Canada. And I thought, this is an example that there is a research ethics, research integrity post that we exist in that we need to capture. 
And I think Corey is beginning to then develop some of those kinds of resources that make that kind of contribution, that bridge the, the theoretical, the pragmatic, and what we do with ethics work. <clears throat> the other thing that the Corey resources did, it allowed us to be able to engage in the international dialogue. And this is whether or not that kind of dialogue you have in Ireland is the same kind of dialogue we're having in Canada, it's the same kind of dialogue that we had at the World Health Organization. So these core resources will also allow us to be able to bridge across countries and frameworks and ways of thinking. Um, and that was also a lot of fun. And then we were able to then develop this minimum knowledge for researchers and research ethics reviewers in both that scholarly dialogue as well as that regulatory pragmatic form. So this was what was really wonderful about coming together with this group is that we had an opportunity to think about research ethics and research integrity as both an emerging scholarly area, as well as a pragmatic area. We were able to develop something that would contribute to a scholarly dialogue, as well as support our students who say, what does informed consent look like? What, do data, what does data management look like? So you've got pragmatic examples that work at multiple levels. Uh, and so I think Corey is a great example of one of the ways in which we, when we begin to move towards a scholarly discipline, are developing these kinds of resources that are useful actually internationally. So I think you should be very, very proud of what Tom and Shauna put together and their team. It is, uh, it is really impressive and fits really nicely into other research ethic education that sit itself there, but in a way that is really, I think, much more advanced. So great job. I'll turn it over to Tom. But again, thank you very much. And uh, thanks for letting me make this argument for a pitch for a scholarly discipline in research ethics. So we've time for questions. Sarah, if anyone has any questions, maybe for Suzanne. Do you want to go ahead? Right. So Lydia's monitoring the chat there. Do you, is there anything online there? Um, I just have one question there. Mm -hmm. um, do you see research integrity and research ethics as working together or one sitting above another? No, they work together. They do separate things. They work together, but they don't sit one above the other. I Visually, I see research ethics as one component that uh, has a role at the beginning of a project, has a role in launching project, and provides support all the way through. Research integrity runs from the beginning and the end, but it's broader and continues on after ethics. Maybe has come to the end of what will make the contribution, which maybe goes a little bit further, but I don't see one sitting about the other because we do different things. I see them actually as a part of a whole. Okay, and I think that's a continuation of that question. What's your opinion on mandating research integrity and research ethics training? The reason I would mandate it is because I think there aren't many ways that we actually get it. And if we don't mandate it, then we leave it to uh, circumstance as to whether you have that kind of training or receive that kind of training. I'm one of the people that provides those training in research ethics classes. I can tell you that my one day training isn't gonna be sufficient to write an application and probably isn't gonna be sufficient to understand the comments that are gonna come back from my colleagues as the research ethics board because they're gonna wonder how does this bridge occur? And so I think mandating training is a way to, push, to ensure that we have a foundation together and then if we can build a scholarly discipline, we then have layers of additional advancement. But I think having a fundamental understanding is important and that may only be able to come through with mandating. Okay, thanks Suzanne, there's no other questions. I have a question for you, Suzanne. <clears throat> it, this is very enlightening in sense and refreshing because we tend to think of ethics <laughs> as hoops that we have to jump through, right? Um, uh, but I find that at least in my experience of what's happening now, it's like I have a ruler and that ruler is standard mm -hmm. and we have an ethics application and take out the ruler and says, okay, mm -hmm. does this measure? Right. Yeah. And I say, wait a minute, this isn't good. It's, it's not good for purpose. Right. Right. So you're taking us back to our rulers here in terms of epistemology and even the ontology, what is, mm -hmm. and asking the thing, what is a good thing, which is, Interesting in a postmodern world, although we're post, post, postmodern now. Um, whereas everything is relative. However, ethics is saying, uh, no. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't mean those are fixed anymore. Mm -hmm. And often we see ethics a bit like our um, speed limits. It's something that you try to hit rather than to, you know, and say, oh, I can do that. Why shouldn't I drive at 80 kilometers an hour, even though there's a cow traveling towards me at the moment? It says 80 kilometers. Right. So 
in a way, I, I think this is so important. However, we haven't been doing it. I mean, I speak from the, the ethics um, uh, committee, and we, I think, partly think we know what we're talking about, and this is no disrespect to the other people, but we often come across, and Sean would know this, something new, something that we didn't think of. So this discourse, this dialogue, has to happen and has to happen rather quickly mm -hmm. because we don't have a, a clear um, set of laws mm -hmm. that guide us. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we're, and this is not, it sounds awful, but we don't want to just make them up as we go along, but we are. In, in a sense, we're still being guided. And, you know, in, integrity mm -hmm. is a change of heart, mm -hmm. not a change of rules. Mm -hmm. So how, my question for you, sorry, that was a very long preamble. My question for you is, how do you think we can cultivate this culture of ethical attitude, mm -hmm. rather than just thinking, yeah. ethical stance, yeah. which, is more than just people assessing mm -hmm. applications, but mm -hmm. even say, I can do this, but is it right? Yeah, I think it's dialogue. I think what, what has happened to us, and particularly in Canada and, and in ethics communities, is that the voice of the researcher is often silenced. Mm -hmm. Is that we get the di we get the paper, we get the document, we get the application, we look at the application, see that as a static application, we apply our understanding to that application, and we say, okay, so here's what we see, here are our questions. But we often don't have a pre or mechanism of a dialogue yeah. where we talk to people and say, so what is it that we do? What is it that we understand? Where is your discipline going in this particular area? So that we then can take that in and say, okay, so here are the principles. Those principles don't change. We did have a dialogue about whether we have all the right principles and whether some of our principles need to be But we do have these principles and the principles have certain interpretations, but those interpretations can change as the, as the uh, science begins to expand or goes into additional areas. And we have to be there with our research colleagues to say, how are you doing this? What are you thinking? And then have a dialogue with us. And that's where our expertise comes in. So here's what the principle says. So here are the ways in which you can avoid that cow. So you're driving down the road and you wanna go 80 kilometers an hour. Okay, so let's talk about that because it's important for your, your methodology that you go 80 kilometers. There's a cow in the road. So how do we work with you about avoiding that cow in the road, right? Like what is it that we can do to say, there's this issue. How do we help you think about that cow in the road? Um, well, we take our expertise of applying the principles, interpreting the principles, and understanding sort of the intricacies of what that means in that kind of method, methodology, this matrix. So we, the world is changing for, from policing to mentoring, really, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And uh, that's new. Yeah. <laughs> and, if you, and if you look at some of my work from my colleague, Helen Berkeley in the UK, she's talking about the, the original Helsinki Declaration talked about these committees not as being policing committees, but as being guiding committees. So people would apply to a committee and get guidance on the ethical acceptability of what they were doing, not necessarily that we would be the police. Mm -hmm. So I think that shift to the regulatory frameworks and the regulatory applications has diminished our role, but also doesn't recognize the expertise that grows at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Irene Kavanagh from University College Cork and Research Integrity Support. So one of the things we're looking at, and it relates to the previous um, question and discussion, is to move from that culture, to move to a culture of research with integrity, so moving beyond the kind of compliance mm -hmm. kind of tick, tick box. So in terms of research ethics, um, one of the things that's kind of has happened because of this regulatory framework is that, okay, so researchers submit their, their ethical protocol gets approved or not approved or whatever. So that's that, and that's that box tape. Mm -hmm. Now I get on with my real research mm -hmm. design. That's right. Mm -hmm. So right. I'm just wondering, and what we're trying to say is how do we approach it from the point of view is that actually your, your research ethics uh, protocol is actually really intrinsically part of your research design and will make your, your research better. Yes. And I'm just wondering from the, the Kari resource, that's quite a tricky thing to, yep. to bring out. And in terms of what you provide with Kari, do, do you think yeah. you're able to achieve that through the platform? 
I think we are. I think you can also be the judge of that too when you go out and yes. assess and see does it have the components that you could utilize to speak to those pieces of that responsible conduct of research once something is in the field and is being conducted. You know, we are there with them. Are the ways in which our our knowledge, our expertise, our contributions were with them into the field, and then comes back. Should things happen, or should there be a discussion of how do we make some choices when we're actually in the field? See, I think those resources did because we have that in the back of our minds mm -hmm. that you know research ethics is just one place, and then there's the research integrity that occurs once something is in the field, and that's where the engagement with the participants occur. That's where decisions about research and the conduct of research occurs. And so it is building that trustworthiness, again, with our colleagues that says, this is a space where you can come in and have a discussion. I always tell my researchers, if something goes wrong, just call. We, everything can be fixed for the most part, but we need to hear from you. And we need to hear from you at the beginning, not later on in the process when something's really gone wrong. Hear us from the beginning. So my researchers will often call me and say, I don't know what to do, or, can you guess what just happened? And I was like, okay, so let's talk about what are the kinds of things we can do to avoid the, the cow in the middle of the road, right? So I think building that trustworthiness and that dialogue and recognizing that that boundary should be fluid between us and the researchers and our expertise has a place and their expertise has a place. Mm -hmm. And that dialogue together makes ethical conduct of research and ensures research integrity because we're having that ongoing dialogue. If we are just the police, just monitoring, just doing compliance, then they don't then they want to avoid us. It's because then they don't want to tell us something has just gone wrong. They want to fix it and hopefully everything will go fine. Um, but if we have that kind of dialogue and we've built that trustworthiness, then we have that relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's where research integrity then and the expertise in research integrity becomes important through that trustworthy relationship. But it is a culture shift. And there are places where this is not the culture where you don't actually get to call the board chair and say, guess what just happened to me? So there are places where compliance really is the focus, where risk management really is the focus. And I think and that is because we don't have a mechanism for having a dialogue and say, here are all the various ways you can do this work. And here are all the different ways in which you can have this kind of, of collaboration and not lower the standards, not lower the expectations, but in that dialogue, achieve more integrity. We see, we, achieve a sort of greater compliance by having that dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, but it is different. It is a culture shift. And it isn't a culture shift that is adopted everywhere. So you're right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Just, just, but just, just to add to that, I suppose, in terms of an analogy from the discipline that I effectively work on, on the databases, um, you know, we would have a situation where um, people would be excluded as of the design process because of course the professionals actually know best. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, then what we find essentially is that there's fundamental design issues. Yeah. Okay. So, mm -hmm. I mean, to carry that analogy actually over to what we are doing in terms of our model as such, it's very much, I think, a top down approach that we're actually adopting at the moment. Um, and there certainly is a dialogue, um, a human dimension missing. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're doing is we're basically making inference in terms of what. The interpretation of the usage or the intention will be within an application as such. And yeah. uh, so, most definitely, um, you know, to get that kind of legal ground whereby we're, we're, we're um, effectively arriving at a legal ground whereby we have you know, the, the applicant and the consultative committee, maybe there's a clear need for a change in the, in the name of the committee as well. Um, because I do uh, appreciate the fact that certainly there is compliance, there is regulation that mm -hmm. certainly do need to be picked. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think to arrive at that in a more comprehensive way. We do need to, again more done. Yeah, I agree with you, Barrett. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Yeah, that bringing that element of collaboration back in and dialogue back in and recognizing that we have that expertise, mm -hmm. recognizing there is a role for us in our expertise and there is a role for risk management and compliance. But our expertise in that space yeah. should be collaborative mm -hmm. with our colleagues who have as much expertise on the research side. Mm -hmm. Very good. Mm -hmm. All right, last question. So, let's so, to you, Tom. Talking about that, removing that sort of Damocles policing role. Um, sometimes I think our ethics committees accuse of sort of drifting in, into methodological oversight. And like, where does one begin and end, do you think? Yeah, I think that's a tough question. The, the question I always pose to my board is what's the ethical issue here? 
Um, if you can identify the ethical issue, because one of the things I promised my researchers, if you get your comments back and you get your review back and you don't understand why we've asked something or you think we've drifted into an area of methodology that you think is outside of our purview, I promise you that I will be able to tell you what the ethical issue is that we're arriving at. And so I'm trying to also get my reviewers to articulate that a little bit better. So for example, um, sometimes we'll use the phrase, I don't know if you can up your ethics, but how are you gonna manage your data? And you think, okay, how are you gonna manage your data? I'm going to put it on my hard drive. I'm gonna put it on my computer. Like, what are you asking me? How, what am I gonna manage my data? Like, what's that mean? What we're really saying is how are you protecting the identifiers? How are you protecting identifiable information? How are you managing that confidential or sensitive information? How are you making the separation between your identifiers and where are you gonna store your de-identified data and where your analytical databases? And we're asking a different question, but that's not the question we ask. We ask the question of how are you going to manage your data? Or I love the one that was that we were set back when someone says, well, how are you going to destroy your data? And the researcher said, I'm going to have it eaten by goat. And I thought, that's brilliant. Because in fact, that's what we ask, right? Is how are you going to, and instead we're saying, what are the ways in which you're going to take your identifiers and you're going to destroy them? But when we're drifting into those methodological areas where there's this interaction between risks and integrity and methodology, if we can pull ourselves back and go, so what's the ethical issue here? So I can say to somebody, the ethical issue here is this. Like we had a lot of this with focus groups, for example, when people wanted to argue that focus groups could be done in a confidential way. And they said, well, I'll have everybody sign a confidentiality agreement. I said, yeah, I understand that. But reality, it's a group event. And you don't have control over what people do when they've left your focus group. And there was a lot of pushback to us to say, no, 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 you're interfering in our methodological space. Like, I know how my focus group's going to run. Well, three adverse events later, where people would have information that had been shared out of a focus group in the community, someone called us from the community, an executive director who had been involved in that focus group, promised confidentiality, information went out, this executive director is now in trouble with their board because somebody repeated what was in a focus group, and I say to the principal investigator, I don't want to say this, but I told you so, but I say, so here's why we were drifting into your methodology, is because in fact there's a confidentiality issue here that you can't manage. Instead of the consent you need to tell people, be very careful what you share in a group event because it's not always clear that you can control the information that leads from a focus group. That probably took us two years to get to a place where our qualitative researchers didn't feel as though we were invading in their methodological space, but we had to also articulate we're not talking about the way in which your focus group is being facilitated. We're talking about confidentiality and your ability to hold the information and your participants safe in that confidential space, which isn't confidential. So you need to tell them that it's not confidential and informed consent. So it took us articulating what we meant in an ethical space and them understanding that we had an expertise and we recognized their facilitation of a focus group as their expertise. But it took a while. So it's not always easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks for that. Did a question come in there, Lydia? Uh, no, there's no more questions. Okay. Or actually, sorry, there is. Yeah. Uh, okay, it's a long one. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, interesting uh, regarding methodolo methodological issues. Some reviewers would go into more detail on this, but it would be in a helpful rather than a policing way. In fact, many researchers would say after going uh, through the ethics review process that it has really helped them to design and strengthen their research even though initially they might have thought the whole process was a tick box exercise. Uh, thank you for this very interesting presentation. So it was, yeah, it was a fun yeah. question. Was, yeah. Perfect, that's great. Yes. And there's one person has their hand up. Can we hear if someone asks a question? Uh, I can unmute that person. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just a Thanks, Lydia. Hi, you. I think you can hear me. Yeah. Yep. Oh, perfect. Thanks. Hi, it's Louise Nagel here. Um, and apologies, I, I I joined a little late there, Sean. Um, and I, you might already have have covered um, the the multi site research ethics. I, I don't know if it's something that's come up here, but uh, Tom and I, I suppose we're, we're we're discussing this during the week, and I know we're we're going to be presenting on it in, in the coming days. Is there any um, I don't know. Is there is there any best practice in other um, constituencies or in, in other countries around, you know, recognizing ethics approval in one institute when you're um, applying for ethics, we'll say in, in another university within a, a specific area, or is it something yeah. that- That multi-jurisdictional research issue is a really big issue. 
The United States has what's called single IRBs. That's a new regulation for them where one IRB can act as the uh, sort of main IRB and uh, there's a kind of goes out between the two ethics boards, uh, between two universities that allows one. So we are, for example, in Canada, the single IRB, we're also a registered IRB in the United States for a couple of projects that are happening in the United States. We don't have that in Canada. We are encouraged to develop MOUs with other institutions or other RBs so that we can share uh, and not do a dual review or a double review. I can tell you that that has gone a couple different directions. Um, one direction it has gone is it has made it much more streamlined for researchers to not have to go through multiple different review committees who may have different perspectives on uh, the ethics or the application, and that has streamlined it for researchers and not have them end up in a kind of ball bouncing between two ethics committees with different views on something. Um, the flip side has been that the dialogue in the United States is that the, that single IRB may miss some local issues that are really important and they may make decisions and approve something which when it comes to a local implementation has missed some of the local components, which is one of the reasons why we haven't in Canada gone completely over to the direction of having a single IRB like the United States has. So there's no good practices, but there's a lot of dialogue out there. So I would watch the dialogue that's happening in the United States around single IRBs. So there's small s IRB. So if you look at the kind of dialogue that's happening around those single IRBs, there's also multi-jurisdictional research. And I think that probably will come up in uh, Greece at the Research Integrity uh, uh, okay. Conference. Yeah, thanks. Because it is a big issue. And, and I'm really glad that we as research ethics boards are talking about that as an issue for our researchers. Uh, the fact that trying to streamline to the kind of comments that come back, having one board and one set of comments, but at the same time being able to find a way to recognize and acknowledge that there may be differences in local implementation that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, so I don't think there's any best practices yet, but it's a lot of dialogue. So, uh, uh, so thanks for that question. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Louise. That was a great question. Okay, so I think, yeah, I think we're ready to go. Uh, I think it's, thanks very much, Suzanne. Thank you very much for that. Now, we'll move over to the second part of the second main part of today's session, which is the demonstration of Cori. I do think it's all, I, I was standing there and eventually the questions were still coming. I actually had to sit down. It was, so it was great to have that engagement both here in the room and online. So thanks very much for that. So over to uh, Dr. Tom Farley, who's going to take us through demonstration of Cori. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, Sean. Um, yeah, I think you're being very polite calling me a taskmaster. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, a few times uh, we've done a session on Monday, and uh, apparently I'm a warrior, which fitted exactly um, with a big stick. Uh, no, it's uh, it's been <clears throat> it's been it's been it's been good fun uh, working on on the project here. Uh, there's a QR code, uh, as Sean mentioned earlier. It's built in articulate rise three sixty, um, which is a variation of the of the articulate family. Um, so apart from being a lecturer and an academic developer, I was a sort of uh, a instructional designer on the cheap. Um, so I, I actually built all of the all of the materials. Um, so I suppose one of the big things there was sort of conveying to the members of the team what the material looks like. And I suppose that when you're designing something which is to be engaged with asynchronously, when you are, are used to sort of teaching, because you think when you deliver everything in PowerPoint, you were there to bring things alive. Uh, with Cory, the idea was that it's there and it's and, and it's available and it has to be worked through. So it's about it was just about sort of trying to come together with some sort of shared articulation of what uh, it could be or should be or whatever like that. So as I said, yeah. So that's just the the, the thing there. Um, I suppose. Uh, you know, so uh, as I said, yeah. So it's articulate rise three sixty. I thought one of the things there. Um, I I describe myself as a critical technophile. It's that I'm a huge advocate for the of technology and it enables things that we couldn't otherwise do. I teach on a lot of blended learning programs and fully online programs. And I'm always mindful that I teach in courses where if online didn't exist, my students ain't getting a degree. It's as simple as that. This is all sort of 
esoteric debate, to, you know, teaching students from all around. However, as I said, I am also an educator. Um, I, I've written quite a bit around the use of virtual learning environments, like Canvas and Blackboard, Moodle and all of that. And what sort of inspired me the whole time was the virtual learning environment and the paper I came across said, let's put the L back in the BLE. So I think it's that so when we are going to use technologies, it should be a learning environment. And sometimes somebody might say to me, well, you can't do it well as face to face. Anybody ever been in Theatre L in UCD? Yeah. Holds about four or five hundred people. Mm -hmm. You could be dead, and as long as you don't smell, no one will even notice the difference whether you're actually in class or not. So you're just doing a performance. So I would often think, you know, argue that you know if you do good online stuff, it can certainly uh, it, it can certainly be a positive experience. So some of the stuff and um, Sean has, has mentioned it already. It's about open access, so we've we've licensed it under Creative Commons. It's uh, BYCC or non-commercial, uh, but yeah, that's the only restriction that we have on it. Non-commercial, you can do with it as you wish. Uh, just don't charge for it. Um, I was just telling someone on Monday. I had a paper published, and they came across it there recently, and uh, they were asking me to pay eight euro for a paper that I gave out open access. Uh, it's not worth eight cent, and I'm going to eight euro already. With me. <laughs> but it is, I mean, I think it's part of, and I think like what we're doing as part of the Curry team, it's also an extension of who we are and what we believe. And, and certainly, I think uh, open <laughs> access um, is, I think, a, a, a big part of research ethics and integrity. Uh, I'm often surprised by how many people. Uh, when they're going to somebody on the research going to go, no, we will keep it and we will destroy it. And you're going to go, no, you won't because you've got the EU to pay for it. Have you heard of Plan S? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I think that's so, I suppose it's about walking the walk and talking the talk. And I suppose, as, you know, uh, elements of universal design for learning. So you'll see here as we go along, trying to incorporate elements of, of, of UDL. Design, as I said, to be asynchronous. So, I mean, um, I often think there's a, there's a sort of like a word, word salad when it comes to online. We use online, hybrid, high flex, mixed, distance. And we sort of force them all in together and people are often quite sure. The asynchronous is simply to be designed to be used at any time. There will be nothing else there. So whatever you see online, that's it. It stands up on its own merits. And that in itself represents a, another challenge because there is nobody else to... To make it happen there like that so i think that was the, the the challenge there but as i said that articulation of the vision you know to try and encourage to, to use the features of rise and what i like about rise is i said that you know it does enable you to do lots of things even if you're just presenting text you can make it a bit more visually attractive and a bit more interactive and you can underestimate you know that thing about just being visually attractive um, and I often say I, I, you know, run a lot of sessions with people, and and it's surprising when I, I'd be dealing with lecturers, and I would say like, many of you would use technology enhanced learning, and most of them would not put their hand, keep their hand out. I'd say, do you not use PowerPoint? Oh well, is that not technology enhanced learning? So, with those sort of ideas there, but using some of those features, and you know, as I said, so even PowerPoint can be made to look attractive. However, as long as it's not an explosion in the paint factory, somebody thinks it looks really cool, but you know, like sort of uh, white on a pale blue background or whatever else there, it just doesn't doesn't work. Um, so I suppose like, the thing about yeah, one thing, and this is I often quite champion it. Um, UDL people often need something to do about disability. It's good design. UDL is just, the key word is universal, for everybody can benefit from that. Good design is good design. So I suppose they were some of the things there. So um, it's built. Um, this is, I'll, I'll come to it in a moment there like that. Um, but uh, Tara, as I said, uh, unfortunately has a bereavement, wasn't able to uh, to make it. So uh, we just sort of, I've done an in, a brief interview with her yesterday. So we're just going to talk through some of the, I have to say, it's strange I'm at stage you know, I need to take off my glasses. So we had... Stop sharing. Stop sharing that one. 
Hum, legal. E rapidinho aqui antes. Okay. So this is just, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain this up a little bit more, but um, so Tara was responsible for three, for three lessons there. So we just, and you're sharing this out, yeah? Tara, hi. Um, so sadly you can't be with us uh, today. So, or, well, it will be today when we're showing the video. So um, you're responsible for, for three lessons, uh, principles of, uh, Research uh, integrity. I'll just bring up the slides here again. So your principles of research integrity and principles of research ethics. Um, originally they were meant to be one one particular unit. You then split them in. What were your thoughts? What were your thinking pat around around doing that? Yeah. So um, they were meant to be one big unit, but I suppose as we're starting to pull all the material together, um, we kind of realised that there's there's quite a lot of information. Um, in it, and it would be better to address them separately, so so that people can get an understanding of the principles of research integrity, what they need to know around that, then understand the principles of research ethics, and then we have an exercise at the end of lesson three. Just press play there again. It just seem to stop it. No. No. Yeah, that's what this meant by asking cronies. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, I, well, actually, talking about UDL, um, so the course should be made bigger. I don't would normally do it. No, it's fine. Maybe. You no, sure? Or whatever, yeah. So, yeah, that's fine there. So, but actually, that is a point about UDL. We have a look at my settings. I have to have bigger, uh, bigger. Okay. So, anyway, this is what it will look like here. So, we're just doing it in. in sharing so we just start the course and as i said i think we're going to have to put in a sort of caveat that you know if somebody wants to be an expert in any one aspect you know we're, we're saying go off and do more work it's only just there intended to sort of to provide a, 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 a an interesting sort of um and i wouldn't say an aside but as i said I suppose one of the things we had to try and decide early on was we can't be all things all people we're trying to give enough of an information here there like that so it's designed, it's I can't use it. <laughs> it's, it's too fiddling, sorry. Are you trying to? No, that's okay. I'm not going to... No, sorry. I'm so I'm... Yeah. Okay. So this the first is just the lesson one in, in uh, navigating the course. Lessons two is principles of integrity and principles of research ethics. They were done by Tara. Lesson four, and we come to Donia. There is lesson four: vulnerability and vulnerable groups in research and evidence uh, informed practice. And um, is Anya. Number six, myself. Lesson seven: informed consent. And lesson eight is Suzanne. Um, lesson nine, data storage and management. So, okay, so I'll just take you briefly through. So this is what, what the units will, will look like here. And I should say they're all fully compatible with tablets, with phones and stuff there like that. So each one here, they, there's a, a fair degree of variability, but each one will start off, will have an introduction. And say so just... We didn't go as far, they're not going to be called learning objectives or anything as formal as that, but just sort of stuff that, that we're going to set out. Even just the way they sort of animate coming in. And as I said, just, she actually was saying she likes uh, quotes, so you can sort of just vary the, the, the thing. So a lot of it is still text, as I said, it's designed to be as sort of interactive, but at least even just visually, you're just drawing attention. It's clearly divided into different sections here. Um, so as I said, I'll just come down here a little bit. Yeah. So one of the things. One of the things here, I mean, it's just simply the, a lot of the. 
sorry. I'm just, what are you trying to do? I, I kind of, <laughs> The sensitivity in it's in small. Sorry, it's my fault. I should have set this up different. So yeah, so it's a, it's just a lot of text here, but just to sort of make it interactive. So, but also the set of resources here. So research misconduct. So we tried to vary in terms of this tabular form. There's interactivities there that we that we've done here. This key takeaway. So every each one of them here. Just to sort of get you to re reflect and think what you know what what sort of brought up you. It'll also now also I should say that each unit is designed to be standalone. So as I said, and we were very clear on that. You don't because I had to, we had to try and avoid as you saw in lesson seven, as you saw in lesson six. In theory, each one. I mean, I ideally, I think someone will complement each other, but we've designed it in such a way then that it's not. So as I said, then. It's, <coughs> So this is another one here by, by Tara. Once again, she likes her quotes. She actually was saying, yeah, oh yeah, she asked me to draw attention to this. Research ethics focuses on the doing where research integrity focuses on the being. So as I said, it was, it was just a nice one there that, that, that she brought up here. So we also have, Aaron. That's a nice one to look at there. Just that example there. Yeah. Well, yeah, so what we've done here is Bring up here. Yeah. So the key ethical principles. So just to vary things up, at one stage we're talking about videos, but we've also just created, so to introduce this here. There are a number of key ethical principles that should be followed in order to conduct ethical research. These ethical principles protect and safeguard all those involved in the research process, such as the researchers themselves, research participants, and society. Furthermore, these principles support research ethics committees when reviewing research ethics applications to ensure the safety of any research participants and so that the benefits of the research will greatly outweigh any potential risks. This lesson describes 12 of these key ethical principles that all involved in the research process should be aware of. These principles have been informed by several internationally recognised documents which provide guidance on how to perform ethical research. So once again, it says so, and then the, the, the person just works through the different elements. As I said, this text is introduced. Now, I did also mention here that I said the idea of UDL. So every wherever there's an audio or a video, we've also generated a, a transcript. I don't think that's just, just it's but one of those things, just trying to sort of Keep things uh, a bit on, on track here, and you have to get okay. on So, so Anya. So, do you want to uh, just come up here? So, as I said, so on you done the two of them here. So, the vulnerability and vulnerability and vulnerable research are groups in research. So, any what what sort of why those two particular topics are anything? Well, I suppose coming from a social care background, the whole area of vulnerability was of interest, and I suppose I just wanted to highlight some of the conceptual issues around vulnerability and vulnerable groups. And some of the safeguards as well that, that can be deployed um, in, in undertaking research with vulnerable groups. Yep. So, as I said, this, uh, as I said, so once again, even just variations and just how we how we bring the material up here. As I said, it's, uh, as I said, it's, it's a lot of it's just text in many ways, but but as I said, how you. So, sort of a learning curve as well, even learning about alt text and everything in terms of describing describing pictures and diagrams. So, uh, to, to, to give yeah. Tom a clap in the back for, for the instruction you've given us, I think, for me. Yeah. So, as I said, um, yeah. So, as I said, I, it, it's just about by even making it appealing and just structuring. So, everything is section one, section two, section three. So, at least a person can, can, can walk through it there. And then we'd also have. As I said, once again, the, the, the key takeaways. In lesson five, we generated a video then. So, oh, sorry, we also would have references and additional resources then like that. 
So we'll do it to the Pika and the evidence informed uh, practice. So yeah, I just want to play a little bit of the, yeah. the video here. This video is on the Pyramid of Evidence, an adaptation of Ingham Bloomfield's one published in 2016 and referenced at the end of this lesson. The Pyramid of Evidence provides a useful scientific perspective in appraising evidence. It is not an exact scale, but rather a broad rule of thumb. At the base of the pyramid is the least strong form of evidence. These include reflections, opinions. So once again, as I said, there's nothing fancy there. That's just PowerPoint. And it's just animating the text. We're just making the point there where I was just saying to Arnie, like if, if you just talk for three minutes and nothing happens, where if you just animating the text, something just visually happens. And the same thing again, then there is a, a, a video transcript there like that. So. So for, for that, uh, so that's the thing. On lesson six, uh, I'm sorry, anything else that you wanted to draw attention? Any the oh, sorry, the knowledge checks then that uh, Arnie would have had then as well, then like that. So yeah. yeah, so we've done some of the units some of them have knowledge mm -hmm. checks, some of them less so. So mm -hmm. it's something there that we've kind of left up mm -hmm. the 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 author and each mm -hmm. one there like that. So I suppose the the lessons are highlight areas of interest that, that people can go go further explore. And some of the debates as well that there's sometimes there's no clear right or wrong, so it's it's just a matter of um, finding your niche in, in for your research in whatever context it's it's in. You see there on the left, as I said, if you want to work through the units, it'll actually give you a visual indication of how much you have you have gone through there like that. Mm -hmm. So you can see lesson four wasn't fully completed, but as I said, there's not an expectation that you can dip in and out. Uh, in lesson six, then I think there's something I wanted to draw people's attention to. So if we just scroll down to the video. Mm -hmm. So here we have, so this is the lesson that I produced. Hello, let us examine a topic that's crucial to the research process, yet often overlooked in the academic world, the ethical importance of inclusive research practices and how they contribute to social justice. Imagine you're conducting research that aims to solve a public health or social issue. Now, think about whose voices are most impacted by this issue. Often, we find that the most affected individuals are rarely consulted or involved in the research that seeks to aid them. This exclusion isn't just unfair, it skews our understanding and the solutions we develop. You know, it's worth that video. You read underneath? Audio element generated by naturalreaders.com from text supplied by the lesson. Someone from the BBC that you know. I've had a bad cough, are we? Yeah. So, and the thing was, uh, something that we, we, we had discussed about. Uh, and, and like Suzanne had mentioned there earlier about you know the new technologies, Gen AI is it is where we are. Mm -hmm. We're very explicit. It's it's clearly said where we use. I wrote the text, so I just put it in to an audio, and it just generated. And you can pick the voice. Mm -hmm. I, I'll show you one there made for Suzanne. She actually wanted with the with it, the um, Scarlett oh, Johansson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would have had the same. Um, free, this was a free. That was a free version. But she's um she's suing ChatGPT. Yeah. So I think, I think that, that, but it's just a bit of fun with it like that. But also, as I suppose we were talking about the responsible use of Gen AI. I don't see any particular problem with it. Same thing again. Then there is the the video transcript uh, out there. Um. So on lesson seven, then the informed consent. I'd say it's, it's just you, you can jump in and out yourselves there like that. So. Just want to scroll down. Is it is it the audio in this one as well? I um the video I think was in this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. Just scroll down. That's not just me. <laughs> video in this one as well? In the audio. Right there. This yeah, one. there. Yeah. There are three main components of informed consent. These are one, that consent should be meaningful and informed, two, that consent is voluntary and intentional, and three, it should be ongoing and documented. The first component, that consent should be meaningful and informed, is comprised of 13 elements. It is important to note that while the elements under this component are described in a list, they are not intended to be sequential. 
However, they are related and together form the basis of meaningful consent. Later in so that's great. Same again, there's a transcript. And some, some of the features we use in lesson 10, I just want to draw your attention. As I said, we, so there's lots of stuff, there's tables, it's just the, the person who's going through it is having to click on something, listen to something there like that. So I um, had, a, had a bit of fun here with Sean's stuff. Um, so I think this is, you know, the, avoiding predatory journals. So we just go back up. So yeah, you can see here that that, that was actually generated by Dali too. Which is open AIs. Uh, so we just asked something about predatory journals. And then once again, you click on start. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Once again, this is it's just breaking up that the person is going to have. To, I mean, I could have just made that one big long list, but it's just to sort of do something there. The thing with predatory journals, then if we just scroll down, once again, I'm just doing a bit of bold. So, but they're good order practices. Yeah. Yeah. Going down. Yeah, once again, just made a video. This was, uh, Sean made a video and then there was a CERNs on the background. So I made him redo it again, never like that. So, but as I said, if you look at it, we have, you know, human voice from, from Sean and from, from Anya, and then we have the Gen AI. This one here had a bit of fun. So this is the, the credit <laughs> model here. So just once again, to make things interactive. So these are all hotspots. So this literally starts off as an image. And then Sean just supplies the text, and then the person just simply clicks on and walks through, walks through it there like that. As I said, and genuinely in terms of as a digital learning resource and as in terms of digital transformation, yes, I had some skills with with articular rights, but genuinely somebody, you know, with with sort of reasonable skills could actually be using and creating it at, at Royce three sixty. So uh, if you go back up then, sorry. Yeah, so just as I said, the template here, once again, we just use the hotspots there. So what would be in an authorship agreement? Once again, as I said, you can make it in different ways. It's just the idea of getting the person to sort of interact with, with the material a little bit more. So hopefully like I say, we've used, as I said, some of the, the, the functionalities here. Once again, just the, yeah. So there's a scenario based here. So you click on, the different options there. And there's kind of a, an opinion on each option. Yeah. And so there's options given. So a dilemma is pitched. So how would you handle a particular dilemma? There's a couple of options given there. And then like there's no, with these dilemmas, there's sometimes, well, sometimes there's a very clear cut wrong answer, but sometimes it's a bit of, well, I need a bit more information. So what yeah. we did here is we just provided a small bit of an opinion piece, kind of like a expert review. Like if you went with option A, is I, I don't know exactly now, will I, is it good or bad or what's the opinion? Option B, and again, it's just as Tom would have said, it's just trying to kind of, as opposed to reading it all, is to make it a bit interactive. Yeah, and like the idea was, like as Sean said, I think it's, it's certainly not a knowledge check because that's not appropriate. It's simply just a dilemma, and here's your your resources here once again. Yeah, and this is the same, just another one there, same idea, same idea that there's a couple of options given to so ideally a user would reflect first, think of the various options, and then maybe an expert review. So maybe how they what what suits well there, yeah. and you can see there's a little bit of text there. And it was funny because it's it's like in the conversations then, as everybody became a bit more familiar with Royce, they might say, or once we had one or two lessons to look at, they might say, "Oh, so what you done with Sean's? Can we do something there like that?" So I think that was that was one of the useful things that uh, that we done there like that. So yeah, I mean that's that's Royce three sixty. I mean, like, and, and genuinely, um, really all it does is starts off with that planning and that conversations with, with people. And then, as I said, as you see more, you can sort of appreciate the potential. If you have never used Royce 360 or you've never seen it before, people don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. So they might just give you some sort of text for where at least then we can sort of play around with stuff there like that. And I think it's going to be a bit of a evolving. I mean, uh, there'll still be a little bit of fine tuning. I suppose this is sort of soft launch in a, yeah. in a way. Well, the plan is though, we just literally ran out of time, there will be a trained trainer component to this so that if somebody wanted to use it going forward themselves in their own teaching practice, there'll be a few guidelines to how to use it. Though that'll only be you know, there two or three pages of content, but we just literally, timelines didn't have it to us. We didn't want to slap together something randomly. We wanted to put a bit of thought that if somebody really wants to use this in their own uh, training or their own teaching, what, what would be potential exactly. guidelines for it? Yeah. So that, that would be an add-on. It's going to be called lesson 11, but it won't necessarily be a lesson. But again, it's hopefully to sort of encourage 
people to colleagues to use it maybe in their own teaching practice if there are particular lessons so again it's not that all lessons will be applicable either no and that's why we set them up that you don't need to do two in order to do three yeah. and so on like that and so when we do that i suppose train the trainer for one of a better expression um yeah as i say you'll sweep you, you'll pick a suite so you know five seven and nine might suit you and six seven and three might work for you so i think that's where we're where, where, where we're sort of aiming to go there like that but um, it's been a bit of fun, uh, to say the least, and hopefully, like I said, people would think it was a, a worthwhile endeavour. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And there's loads of resources out there that actually helped inform us in the unit, so all those resources then are acknowledged by us through references, but then there's kind of additional resources that if you find, oh yeah, I need to know a bit more, because Tom would have said that at the very start, like, this is not going to cover everything. Mm -hmm. It's to give people a solid foundation on responsible dissemination or a solid foundation on informed consent. It's not going to make them masterful with it, but then we've signposts for, for additional resources to where they can go if they want more information. Mm -hmm. sure. that fair that's, a, yeah, that's, that's a good summary of it. Then. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. No, definitely it's time for questions. Thank definitely. you for you. And one thing I notice is that, uh, and to quote a philosopher from 2,500 years ago, Socrates, he said, the written word cannot defend itself. So once you put it out there, if someone misinterprets this, um, you're not there to say, no, 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 you misunderstood me. And how, my question for you is, what is the interaction that you have with the people who are using this? Because up to now, it's, it's very consumer approach. Like this is the material you consume it at your time, etc. But how do I engage in a, a a didactic way with whoever is presenting. So I say, I, Tom, I disagree with you on this. Mm. Um, and then you say, well, Chris, that's because you're thinking about it from this. I say, but wait a minute. And that dialogue is, doesn't seem to be there. No. How do you address that? Because we I don't. mean, when Susan, Suzanne no, was- we, we don't, it's as simple as that. Okay, yeah. but I think it's very important because yeah, what no. Suzanne was saying right. earlier on, is that we have to interact and build a rapport and say, gosh, I never thought about that. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I don't mean to be glib. And I, I, I don't that. mean no, no, this but... is a criticism because this is a great source. Yeah. It reminds me of the um, epigeum, the, the training as well, which was yeah. very much like this. But one of the things that I found was I was doing that. I wanted to shout at them, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, um, I, but I, it wasn't that. that. I think that's where it's useful in the teaching class. Yes, yeah. We use this as a tool in our teaching to get away with and then to yeah. what to we'll do with informed consent, and then we look in the next lecture, we'll want to have a discussion on that. Oh, okay. yeah. and then we can use that. Yeah. You know, because that's essentially what I would do with the FPG training as well. Oh. You know, so it's a, it can't cover everything, no. and you do need somebody to tease this out. Yes, discussions yeah. with it. I mean, some of the content I would take maybe is quite clear. You know, but then first, that doesn't mean there won't be questions. For it. And it will cause dilemmas, or yeah. it might, yeah. you know, it might say, wait a minute, I have a situation and this doesn't address it. Exactly. Yeah. Even yeah. the dilemmas that are outlined there, because there's a few practical scenarios of dilemmas, and like they'll really be a dilemma in themselves. You know, well, if I feel I'm left hanging here, how do I yeah. handle this? I need to talk to somebody. Yeah. And that's, I suppose, there's two modes for that. One being that there will be a feedback form up in, in lesson one that we're going to be looking at. If somebody wants to provide feedback, they can do something like that. Now that feedback form technically will be, well, not technically, it's going to be anonymous. So obviously that's not necessarily going to be the whole discussion piece. But there are, our names are all there. That if somebody really felt, look, actually something's amiss and something, they just kind of reach out to us yeah. and we look at uh, fixing up. But really, I would think that where this is, and this is very much down to in tutor's focus as well, is right. to develop tools that can be used in the classroom that can actually help. And like the, uh, I, I would hope in time that we'll see that that will be what yes. is. Yeah. I, I, I think my, my concern would be that this is not presented as something that will take over the need for, I know, as you were saying, if you have a theater of 500 students, you don't have that rapport. Yeah. Um, yeah. And not everything lends itself to blended learning. And we have to ask ourselves the question, are we using blended learning because it's convenient or because it's a good tool? No, yeah, no, I, and we I, have to be honest if we have to maintain our integrity with that. It's a, gosh, I really don't want to travel for an hour and a half when I can do this online, when in fact, uh, being a tutor discussing in a group of 10 and they say, well, Chris, I think you're talking nonsense here. I say, okay, tell me why. I think, I think we're, we're going to need to strengthen how we articulate, how, how we, we sort of envisage being used. And while there is a, a, le a level of 
feedback certainly in that initial phase. I, I mean, I I can't for one say it'll forever and never, you know, I mean, it gets, it'll be put out there and we sort of envisage exactly as Sean was saying that saying teaching practice he would use it as a resource and then use it as a, as a jumping off point because we would genuinely never produce anything if we just worried about every single thing oh no i agree we, with what you i'm saying about that that experience is up there like that but i think it'll be taken and hopefully used in terms of the simulation of the banks with the, the lesson I don't know on community. And Tom, and, and you mentioned something there which was very interesting about social justice. Mm -hmm. What about the justice uh, for whoever is teaching? You might be dead and you'll still be teaching. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, because they, <laughs> or I might the be dead and still be teaching. That would be like One of the things I, <laughs> I came across recently is uh, Stephen Fry found himself, he said, uh, reading the Lord of the Rings yep. online, where he never read it, but AI composed the truth. He says, I wouldn't mind that. I don't mind not reading something for 48 hours, as long as they pay me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is the same thing in terms of, could we have these, depending on who, who gets their hands on this. He said, that's great. We have a course online, mm -hmm. and we don't need any more lecturers for that. That's gone. That's social justice. So I think but that's, look, I, but the, yeah, but that's a shifting sand. Yeah. Yeah. You are shifting sands, and that's the thing about open access, mm -hmm. you know, and I was asked what to have, and it, it goes out there. Yes. And the only stipulation we did put on was NC non-commercial. That's yeah. the only thing we've asked. So somebody- But if it puts someone out of a job, isn't that uh, an issue? Yeah. I mean, but I can't. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I'm not. So I don't know. Really, no, I don't even live, um, yeah. you know, because, um, will this replace uh, uh, all these staff costs? No, but it's not intended to. It's sort of intended to complement what, what's there. How it's used? Yeah. Yeah, it, this is like you produce a knife, you don't know how to. Yeah. <laughs> so we have two questions there. Jean, do you want to go first there? Just in relation to the content side, is it static or depend? So if it's open access, it can be reused, can it be revised? So, yes. And um, what are the planning? Locally, I suppose, are you going to review again 12 months, 24 months' time and see can stuff be updated? Can we get some feedback? Um, yeah, just kind of questions around that or who takes order of it when Intuner is gone and the sustainability yeah. piece as well? Well, absolutely. It, it's, I suppose it will be, it will evolve. I think it's going to evolve over time. That's why we want that feedback form on it because there would, could be anonymous feedback for something that could be just really useful to actually. Uh, I suppose progress some of the units or some of the lessons, maybe add on a new lesson as well. So I would see it as just something evolving. And that was, I suppose, this is a funded project and obviously funding like anything, funding runs out, but our intention is to continue going because we have a couple of more ideas of things that we want to do. So this, this even though the funding's over, the project, the Cori team isn't finished, so it will be maintained. I think that the beauty of Royce 360, it wouldn't have built, it's relatively easy to, amend and change and, and stuff so yeah we don't see that as being particularly onerous this has been the big the big part of it mm -hmm. and then so even in terms of the derivatives which was something that myself and sean discussed so i originally had nd and he said no we just so because people might take bits out of it mm -hmm. that's fine as well like that so yeah they can take anything they want from us really and are all the, the real librarian questionnaire now but are all the things referenced are they all available open access Every, all over. every image I selected is Creative Commons. It's in the list of further readings and are, are anything yeah. you can hear. Oh, yeah, no, that I've, I've been really strict about it. Because I don't want to put something up with it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I've, I've you know, sort of, and I said, all oh, the images are Creative Commons. The little things are that you just, but that takes a lot of time, but that is the, that's, the, the, that's the payback. But as I said, yeah, you're not going to click on a link and find it behind the paywall. Yeah, only yeah. yeah. right there, but. Okay. Hi, well, part of my question has been answered because I was wondering about the sustainability yeah. beyond the funding, either maintaining the platform or updating it with new policies yeah. or processes that might emerge. Um, I suppose the other question I have is in relation to delivery. I know you're talking about training the trainer, but in the context, say, of Irish institutions like MTU, UCC, the FPG online research integrity is kind of the one that's delivered across the board, and then everybody supplements that training with in-house programs and so on. 
Um, like, how do you see this working in the context of the the rollout of every gene? So, say for instance, lesson two there, the principles of research integrity. That's kind of one of the modules mm -hmm. in every gene. So, I'm always conscious of overloading researchers with all these different training opportunities, and they're like, oh, which one am I supposed to undertake? Which one is? I'll give you an answer when the recording is finished. <laughs> so the um so with the, that's a very good question. I suppose with the FEGM training, obviously that is required in order to be eligible for a lot of funding. So I mean, you could see why researchers will just go to that and then they say, look, I've done that, I move, want to move on. I suppose what I would feel is different to ours is well, I, I would think ultimately it's, it's not that we're looking to com compete with FEGM or anything like that. I would think it would complement FEGM. Like we, I certain topics here, like FEGM does not go into a lot of detail on research ethics. It's yeah, there's one, there's one module, and that's what I was going to say, is this is it's very, very more... It's more like more that, yeah, that one module, which is quite useful. We use it here in MTU as well for our research ethics training. But it is light touch. Mm -hmm. And this year would go into more detail on yeah. very important ethical principles around informed consent, vulnerability, and stuff like that. Yeah. Equally, yeah. So, uh, FPGM doesn't go into massive detail around uh, good uh, responsible dissemination practices either. And yeah. it touches on scholarship, but, yeah. so, but, I, I, but then FPGM does a lot that Corey's not doing, so it's not a competition, definitely not, I would say, yeah. compliments, but then I do get that there can be an overload uh, for researchers, but I suppose for us, what we felt is that there was a gap there to provide certain information, and that's mm -hmm. what we tried to do, and not just kind of looking to seal the tundra for anyone, uh, any other faculty. Yeah, it goes in more into the, the working with human participants, yes. uh, yeah. which is good, because... The, the epigene doesn't go into it as much. Yeah. 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 yeah, the other thing I was going to add, for example, when I was thinking about informed consent, so we also have a training that everyone has to take that is the Triconsult Policy Statement on, on Research with Human Participants, and that you have to have that certificate in order to be able to apply to us. This, in contrast, when I'm looking at informed consent, is we have a model uh, informed consent form. Here's where you would put all of these different pieces in an informed consent form. And if you had ascent, so you had somebody else who's been doing an ascent form, links out to places that go, here's some model ascent forms that you could use. So it kind of digs down into almost like the, the kind of comments you might get back from a research ethics board where you would say, these are the kinds of things you might want to think about as you're putting these together. So also there's a few challenges there. You know, what happens when a participant doesn't understand a consent form? What do you have to think about? Well, the consent form needs to be written at a six to eight grade level. So it adds a little bit more of that kind of pragmatic detail that links you in a way that some of these upper, the, the training that are more higher level or more um, uh, sort of I would say regulatory based, but don't get down to the type that what do I do as a researcher when I've got, I understand what informed consent is, but what do I do when I build a consent form? What needs to go where? What do I need to think about in terms of conflict of interest? So that's, I think, where we find ourselves is in that kind of gap of providing more pragmatic information that you might get, or you could take in a class and say, so let's look at this module and then let's build off of this module. Let's maybe we don't like the way they've suggested this, but here's the other ways you could do it. So it sits in that gap, that pragmatic gap that often isn't filled around the movement from the principles and the upper level thinking about something to pragmatically, what do I do when I'm trying to actually utilize this information? So I think that's the gap we are trying to fill. Right, yeah. I just look into and I, because there's this one thing there. So, sorry. Yeah, it's part. There's this. Oh, look, sorry. Actually, we, Mary, if you want to. Oh, actually, sorry. Jean was next, and then Mary, because we're just going to look at something just to touch on what uh, Suzanne said there. But I think that that's, I suppose, the wording that jumped out of me there with Suzanne's answer was practical, as in the practical mm -hmm. case. Like, and I think that is something definitely that uh, the colleague team and these resources come in on. Jean? I know there are plans then to assign or offer digital badges for module and that type of thing. And also, would you see in time that there would be a way, maybe not mandating, but that would be a strong recommendation that before anyone even considers uh, applying for ethical approval for a study, that they will complete this? So, first, the digital badge. I think definitely think there's an opportunity there for a digital badge on what type of digital badge, you know, with the weighting, whether it's a workshop one or a bigger one, that, that's something that we can uh, we'd have to discuss. When it comes to requiring researchers to do this within the university, I suppose. That wouldn't necessarily be our decision to make. That's something that we could propose to maybe a research and innovation committee, go to academic council in the university equally. Maybe that's something that other universities that maybe might be watching this recording later on could do. I suppose for us, it, it would, if we wanted this to be required, as in, oh, you have to use the core resources, 
we would be forced to make a recommendation to a particular committee to put that forward then. I, I think, um, I mean, sustainability is relying on sorry, goodwill for the foreseeable future. I don't see that as an issue. The minute you start mandating something, yeah. then I think the universities will have to start yeah. buying into it. And then, and even in terms of digital the balance, resource the issue, to, this yeah, resource yeah, issue is still yeah. mandated. So I think it's stuff there like that. So suggestive yeah. content. Do yeah. you want me to click on it? PDF there, this yeah. one here. Yeah. So? Yeah. Yeah. So, so this, I think this just speak touches on what Suzanne was yeah, saying. Yeah, so like, so what would actually be in 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 the forms rather than just giving headings and stuff there like that? Yeah, it's just it's just that's going to be a bit of a And it gives yeah. it gives guidelines what to say as opposed to a template answer because oh, it's right. Right. Yeah. Like the, the issue with a template answer is maybe sometimes when you're reviewing an application later on, you're actually seeing your own template answer and you're kind of think where well does the researcher really know what they're saying? So so what Suzanne's done here is she's giving guidance. So this is indicatively oh. watching. Kind of the things that you'd be looking to say here as opposed to say this you can get through everything okay you know i mean i mean some of the stuff there i mean like, um like i teach research methods year four in, in trolley and you know that's where i'm telling designing some of the stuff where I'll, I'll actually say to the students you know for your your assignment you know you have to go through lesson three six or eight mm -hmm. or whatever it does so i think it'll be used in different different ways i think mm -hmm. there's something like that mm -hmm. like the mandating thing goes at the down a different road uh, and I don't think we, we certainly at this stage we sort of saw it there but I think some of those issues there yeah as I, as I said it does different things in epic gene and they, you're right I mean some people they just want to get ethics and they just want to get the, and they will take they will take the yeah. path of least resistance and that's that's fine as well you know I think it's it's it's, it's it, it it remains to be seen how it's going to be used. Um, so, so I think you yeah, Mary. So I would like if you would define the difference about the type of mandated training from the first question you referred to and whether and how this fits into it. Yeah. So I'm also thinking about both undergrad and postgraduate students as researchers and supervisors. And actually, are our supervisors trained well enough as research supervisors to engage in that dialogue? Um, and that's what I'm thinking, and also how you can actually get this approved through whatever body it is to get it CPD. So somebody, whoever goes through an open source, whether it's a digital badge or not, that people get recognition. Um, I'm in a professional area where I'm, I'm mandated always to have CPD every single year, and I'm also mandated to be able to lecture in my field, to be able to teach my field. Um, and that's the way we're going when social care work has just got sort of approval and um, we're in an area where mandating of our CPD is part of our process. We must have it. Right. Um, so yeah. I'm interested in the distinction between the first question of yeah. what was the mandated yeah. training and yeah. how we can embody some of the principles and use this tool to fulfill some other yeah. paths as well. I think that's a really good question because I think when we think about mental yeah. training, we're thinking about um, what is it that we want? everybody to know. And Corinne digs down further than that into what I might say to my students who might call and say, I've got to put together an informed consent form. And I'd say, okay, great, go look at this lesson, write a consent form and come back, but it will give you some guidance. And this would be a great, I think, professional development tool to have people take it for professional development training. Would I mandate this training? I think there's more detail here and digs down into areas that people might say, I don't think I need to know this level of detail. Probably not. So there's probably a foundational level of ethics, maybe the first two of principles and integrity that we want everybody to understand. But then when you're digging down, depending upon the research project that you have, or you're digging down into the pieces, I think this would make a great professional development uh, tool uh, when someone wants to go further and might make the choice to go further into these. I think that's a great distinction, but the mandated part would be more, more the fundamental principles and understanding the fundamental principles. And this would be your professional development in if they're going to do research, this digs you down into each of those different kinds of dialogues as a researcher, and where can you find some of that guidance? I think that would be the distinction I would make. And I don't think I would mandate this then because that would be too much, but I think of offering it as a professional development opportunity um, and then give credit for it being a professional development opportunity. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I think conscious of time there now. So I think we look to uh, maybe this one's Tom, first round of applause maybe for that. Thank you. Great response. Thanks to Mary for that question. I think what, what just jumps out of me and is nearly reassuring is, colleagues in the room here and maybe on the line are thinking this, but 
they're talking about CPD and they're talking about digital badge. It's like to me that means it seems to be okay. This doesn't seem to be bad, you know, which is quite reassuring. Also, thanks very much for that. And look, I think we're doing okay in time. We're down 10 minutes for closing, but closing is quite, it was nearly a bit of a cushion that we had here. I suppose ultimately closing is the thank yous. Okay, so I do a couple of thank yous if you don't mind to say first in the DLR funding, first and foremost, that we would not have been here. We would not have necessarily come together as a group as soon as we did without that actually funding to kind of drive us on and to kickstart it, I suppose, to a certain extent. And that actually has brought great enthusiasm among the five of us. And again, apologies on the Tara can't be here. But like this won't be the end, and we do have the plans to continue on for that. Special thanks to Brendan Flaherty in the Department of Technology, Hans Lovely. He had he had us set up. We were here yesterday demoing different things, and again here this morning. So it's brilliant to have this uh, this room here, and to be able to do a hybrid event. And hopefully, it was uh, worked very well for uh, people, uh, colleagues online. But very much thanks to Brendan Flaherty, Department of Technology, and Hans Lovely for his support for this. And next, then, Lydia Biscop of Flaherty, uh, who walked into the here. Like these, these events just don't happen. Like there's a lot of obviously logistics around this, and I don't do these. The Cory team, we didn't uh, really uh, actually manage all that. So, special, massive thanks to Lydia. Thanks to you, the participants, both online and face to face. I suppose I know now this doesn't count for everyone online, but even just the team coffee outside it was a very warm atmosphere there. And actually, nearly if anything, that calmed us to kind of say, yeah, this is going to be a good group. This is going to go well. But even just the engagement, the questions, this far exceeded our expectations. And we know that when you're facilitating an event, whether it's lecturing or whatever the case is, that the energy that you have as a facilitator comes from the participants and the engagement you have. So very much, thanks very much for everyone online and for yourselves here in the room. Thanks very much for, that, for all that. And and last, but by no means least, thank, thanks to the Corey team. They put faith in me to actually be the one here, to be standing up and actually chairing today. And this is a big moment for us. So it's very much for me, thanks very much to the Corey team. That will be Anya, Tara, Tom, and Suzanne for their faith that they put in me to meet up today. Thanks very much.